Far ahead. I'll pass the microphone around at this table. Okay, Andrew Trump first. Thanks. Um, it's a comment more than a question, I guess. Um, everybody that's presented this morning has mentioned about um, having people on farms and communicating to consumers that way and the benefits of that. And it was really just, uh, we have Open Farm Sunday that happens every year. And I just wondered how many people who are producers in the room participate in Open Farm Sunday. Um, and maybe organic farmers should get more involved in that. Do I do a show of hands? How many people involved in Open Farm Sunday? There's eight, nine, ten. As far as hands I can see at the moment, so some of us anyway. Um, the only thing I would say is that I mean I've I've often felt a little bit bad about not doing Open Farm Sunday, but I feel that actually we have because of all the school visits and the local farmers groups, and we've had 12 clergy and uh, various different people. I feel that you know my farm is sort of open for a lot of the lot of the year anyway, um, and uh, so so that's why I haven't done it. But I think possibly it's part of the sort of big drive that we should get more people on farms. But if you're doing it anyway, um, yeah, that's my comment. OK, um, I think Marx measures his hand as the second one I saw, but I've seen two others in the queue, so. Hello. Yes, uh, I think I'd like uh, John to ask one, answer one of his questions, but perhaps all the panel would like to answer it. And that is about price parity. Is that is that something that um, we think we should be aspiring towards um, from the market perspective and support perspective and so on? Well, you'll probably notice, Mark, that I just asked the question and I didn't provide the answer. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, I think that as long as I feel that there's a fair margin in what I'm doing for me, I don't really care you know, what the margin is like as far as non-organic is concerned. I mean, I, I can't help by sort of glancing across to the other side to see how they're doing. Um, but ultimately, you know, I've sort of tossed the question around my head, you know, on many occasions. But uh, it always comes back. And I think, you know, actually what Kate said, you know, you just need to step back and remember, you know, why you're doing what you're doing. And it only takes, you know, a few minutes to step back and just do that and then think, well, what on earth was I thinking of? Okay, there was a question on the aisle halfway back. Uh, yeah, it's about um, the Waitrose um, uh, pricing and, uh, and payments. Um, there's been there's a bit of a, a thing in the press recently about them not paying uh, on time. Now, I had a big problem with them, and I'm, it's a shame they're not here today, because uh, I've been waiting th up to three months for them to pay. And uh, it was only after going right to the top before I got some, some answer. But also, I haven't quite threatened to them to say that I was coming to this meeting as well. Maybe this is why they're not here. Um, and as far as, um, as open days, I, th I find that it's very good to have hen parties, actually. And that's only basically because I run a vineyard. <laughs> in terms of Waitrose's attitude to pricing, I think it's quite a sensitive one. We were invited to the Farmers Conference fairly recently, and um, having been on the manufacturing side ourselves, we do understand things like margins quite well. So it was quite an exciting debate, um, because Waitrose, as we all know, actually try and support farming uh, we believe more than most, um, but they actually were pushed into position that the whole industry of retail should do better. The fact that they were trying hard, um, and we do um, put in tremendous pressure on them to try and stick to their own values. The other side of the equation for them is uh, they have to compete. But it was a very um, open debate about pricing, and I think the more open the debate can be, um, it's very healthy. It, it allows the debate to be properly uh, focused on rather than hidden. And um, 
I think there was a great danger in that farming conference that we were at. If, if one or two questions hadn't been asked, everyone would have gone home thinking, if only I'd asked this, if only I'd asked that. It provoked a very interesting debate. Uh, and what the real answers will be, they won't come out until the debate is forced. We believe there's a tremendous value in organic. Um, the messaging has got to be put across. It's, it's, people will do value, pay for value. Certainly we're seeing at the moment within Waitrose, we're seeing a growth in organic um, for the first time in two years, a substantial growth. Why is that? Um, if you look at their analysis of their sales, um, their increase in their sales is in the higher end of their uh, product range and in the lower end of their product range and the middle sector of their products is actually going slightly backwards. Uh, we believe organic has got, got, a, got a position in that higher end, end where the values are worth people paying for and we're certainly seeing within our Waitrose relationship a fantastic turnaround in the last 12 months which I think even they're finding it difficult to believe because there is this slight negativity about organic which we desperately all need to change. Okay, thank you. I've got three lined up at the moment. Martin Peck. Um, I, I'd like to ask John Borsey, uh, taking back to the slide uh, of Wakelands and would you elaborate a little bit on what you think about your fields looked quite big and yet you showed lots of wildlife benefits on the farm so what, what do you think about would your fields be happier smaller or was that the point you were making about in, cre moving increased yields in the centers of fields to the outside some along yeah god um Yes, yeah, some of our fields are quite big. Our average, average field size is 25 acres. Um, I, I know that maybe the Woodland Trust are here, but I'm talking to the Woodland Trust at the moment about maybe putting some agroforestry on our own farm. Um, but we're also going into a large HLS scheme, which is going to add more bits and pieces of more habitat around the farm. But, um, you know, I could do a lot more than we're doing. Um, and... Um, the difficulty is is um, being able to do it um, uh, with some kind of efficiency. That is the main problem. And and I'm actually going back. I'm sort of you know painting myself guilty again of farming like a, a non-organic farmer again. And I know I'm doing it. I can hear it. You're thinking, <laughs> Christ. Um, <laughs> so that's why I'm floundering. Uh, but I I agree with you, and I take on board your comment. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep going. Tolly at the back. Uh, yeah, interesting to hear Waitrose being mentioned. I had a very interesting experience on Thursday evening. I, I kind of go snooping in supermarkets to look at prices from time to time. Now, if you remember, Thursday was the day we'd all been promised a, a snowfall. So I go into the shop Thursday evening about half past seven to check out prices and find that every single vegetable was sold. There's absolutely nothing there apart from one old turnip. <laughs> So I turned around to look at the organic section, and I had an absolute shock. It was completely full up. I'll say no more, but I think you can draw your own conclusions from that about the state of the market at the moment. Do you want to comment, Kate? Yeah, I'm not sure how relevant uh, my experience is, but uh, on Thursday, I did pick sort of four times the amount of leaks I would normally pick for that for the weekend for the shop and they've sold out but um, I'm in that fortunate position where um, they're only stocking my leeks at the moment but that's because the conventional ones they had been buying in were tiny so um, maybe it's I don't know I think that is very scary from a supermarket point of view um, but I don't know maybe we just have to concentrate on nice small independent shops and do it direct <laughs> I think it's been mentioned about the quality of food. And um, I know I'm a sort of practiced cheese and milk man, but I swear I can taste the difference between organic and non-organic milk. Uh, I certainly could in cheese. In cheese, your flavor develops over a period of time. And the different composition of content in that base product accentuates the longer you keep the cheese. Um, doesn't mean to say it's 
necessarily better than conventional in its taste profile, but it is different. It, it, in, in dairy products, certainly ones that are where the flavor is developed, you get a much fuller flavor in an organic product than you do in a conventional. Um, that's my perception. I've sort of tested it. We, we, we obviously spend a lot of time in cheese tastings. And I think we mentioned earlier, what can organic do to actually get back at the forefront? The, the, the products that we sell uh, with innovation, with using the points of difference between our products, we can, that's a challenge we've got to face. Our products have got to taste right. They've got to uh, be well presented and the story that's behind them and the integrity that goes with them. And then we're starting to win the game. But there's no excuse for pr producing a poor product. It doesn't have to look pretty, like, uh, but it has to taste good. And I think uh, certainly Waitrose emphasis, and you, as you've seen with your chefs, what you're finding is your product tastes good. And they will buy taste, but we have to communicate that to them. Okay, there was one question at the back, and then there's another one further. So the, yeah, the gentleman in the middle there. Can, can I, I probably should have been doing this sooner, but can I ask people just to introduce themselves when they speak? Uh, Bill Grayson, um, livestock farm from Cumbria. Um, just, I think Kate picked up on a, a, a crucial point when she mentioned the need to include the external costs of uh, non-organic farming. And it, it ought to be quite clear by now that if that was done, then the price differential between organic and non-organic would be very different to how it is now. Um, Jules Pretty uh, and the Environment Agency did a lot of work back in the early 2000s, um, which demonstrated that, that these costs are very significant and at the moment they're being borne by all of us anyway, as taxpayers, um, but the polluter pays principle, if it were applied, would, would do a lot to help the organic cause. And it's, it's a question of you know, what we could be doing to try and highlight the significance of, of, of that differential in a way that helps us, but perhaps doesn't um, alienate us too much from, from the other side. I'll, I'll move on to the next. There was a f another question further forward on that side. Hello. Um, Sandra White from um, Shoemay Natural Agriculture. I um, wanted to ask Philip and Becky about whether you um, experience any tensions around the very strong proposition to speak the same language as Waitrose and demonstrate that you're really on the same page as them. And I certainly understand that case. But one thing I find extraordinarily difficult is that we, well, I can't remember the last time I heard anybody in the media talk about people rather than consumers. And um, I just think there is, that language is so very powerful. And I just wonder whether we can think about that so much more in terms of trying to influence change. If we keep telling ourselves that we're only consumers, then I think that limits our ability to make choices that are rooted in health and well-being. And I, I wonder whether you experience any tension or doubts around that or how you tackle that problem. Of course, a big question. Um, there's certainly tension in the negotiations and discussions that we have with Waitrose, but it very much depends on the individuals that, that you're dealing with, and I don't think there's any sort of one approach that, that fits all. Um, it is difficult, and <laughs> but the important thing that I'm certainly seeing and realising is that unless you understand their position and their need to be competitive and the constraints within which they operate and the language within which they operate, it's really difficult. You hope over time and by communicating, including involving them on farm visits and getting them out of their offices and onto farms, 
that they start to meet you halfway and they start to pick up some of your language. But you know, it's it's got you've got to move forward towards them and, and to wait for them to come to you. You'll be waiting a long time. One thing I've found is, uh, as Becky says, there's a lot of, of individual uh, influence. And uh, I think Waitrose, again, is something we've got some experience of. There are one or two extremely good people in Waitrose business that come from farming backgrounds and they do understand uh, the issues that we face and what we need to do to de deliver sustainable farming. What our challenge is is to give them the ammunition. So we try and find the ones that do understand our, our industry and try and then work with them to give the information that they can translate internally. Sadly, with, you know, I think uh, our experience has been the one time that they will listen is when something that they want is short. And it's been my, I've been in the dairy industry and I have never known, uh, well, I suppose farming generally, but my milk is my special subject. How can a price jump by about 20% overnight? Uh, with the milk industry, if, if the whole country is one litre short, bet yourself the price will go up. If the whole country is one litre oversupplied, the price will go down. Um, there's a lot of industry issues that, that affect it, but what we've got at the moment We've got a growing organic industry in terms of our customer, and our, uh, we're, we're really fighting a strong argument for the producers. And they actually have got to listen to our arguments now. Um, hopefully, we'll get them out on farm a few more times in the next six months than we've had in the last 12 months, because it's been noticeable. There's a swing in engagement. I think organic had. And, and some of those industries where it has been tabled it is, in, it is organic dying. As it shrinks in terms of importance to them, they, they pay it less attention. So our challenge all the time is to say, come on, this is a speciality product. This is where you can actually make a point of difference between your range of products and your competitors. And that's the sort of game we have to play. Um, I think uh, the farmers, we work with us and try and engage the buyer in understanding his problems, but we have to sort of be in the middle and try and do the translation and try and, and fill the gap in terms of getting these arguments across. Okay, well, so thank you to the speakers now for the, um, and, and for all the points that come from the floor. Um, it's almost lunchtime, but I need to, um, just to bring a couple of points together. I think from the, the discussion and the presentations, I think there are probably four things that have come out for me during this session. One is this emphasis on the need to improve our communication, to make, get the communication right and, and to do better communication. Um, and linked to that, partly getting husbandry issues right, but also being able to communicate evidence is the issue of research, which is a big theme of the event. Um, uh, the other issue that came out are the financial challenges, pricing uh, and those sorts of issues where part of the issue of addressing pricing is to focus on value and generating value, but also to focus, make sure we focus on our values uh, as a, an organic movement to make sure that that then f feeds back in the circle into communication. Um, so I think those are all challenges that we need um, to face uh, and perhaps pick up during the conference. For, for us, we've, we've given the conference the title Making producer-led innovation a reality. And I just want to say a, little, a few words about why we've come to that, and, and to ask in a second Tom McMillan also just to say a few words um, for me, so if Tom would be willing to come forward. Um, the, their innovation is a big buzzword uh, in agricultural establishment and policy circles at the moment. But the innovation that is being talked about is an innovation that is driven by corporations leading to patents uh, and economic knowledge. That basically means to, to have patents making profitable things, it means it's companies being able to make things to sell to farmers and take the income away from the farmers that might otherwise be staying with the farmer. I'm a bit cynical about this. I've, throughout my life, felt that it's really important that the innovation that takes place on the farm is recognised uh, and that producers are able to be much more engaged with taking that process forward. And We've deliberately given the conference this theme because I think it is an opportunity for us to think about how producer-led innovation can really work. And that, I hope, 
will feed through into the workshops. That out of those workshops, ideas for projects might come forward. We have this afternoon, um, at the end of the day, I'm afraid people may be a bit tired by that point, but um, a series of small group discussions planned to help get crystallize uh, producer-led research projects that might be possible to be taken forward. Um, and for those people who really want to engage with the politics of it, uh, at the end of the conference tomorrow afternoon, after the closing plenary, there is a special meeting about the idea of setting up an innovation platform for agroecology, which will lead into the next rural development program, the next funding stream for CAP, uh, with the idea of a bottom-up uh, initiative for research and innovation that comes from producers. So it is something that we really see an opportunity to drive forward. One of the things that has enabled that to take place um, is the en engagement of Waitrose, the Dutch Originals brand, through the Prince of Wales's charitable foundation to fund the Dutch Originals Future Farming Program. And I'd like to ask Tom if he wouldn't mind just to say a couple of words about that, uh, because I think it is potentially quite a powerful route forward. And I'll give you him this microphone. Thanks, Nick. So uh, the, uh, the Dutch Originals Future Farming Programme is a concerted push to support innovation for organic and also like-minded non-organic farms and growers. The main sort of two ways we're doing that is on the one hand, directly uh, supporting and backing research efforts that put producers right in the driving seat, which isn't the way things are normally done, and then also trying to work with the main UK research funders who spend a lot more on research than you know, all of us put in this room together to do likewise. So we're trying to do the, the, uh, the, the, the bits of work directly with farmers and the research funding and so on in ways that the big research funders can copy, can take some inspiration from, and uh, it can inform what, what they get up to. There are three main ways that uh, farmers and growers can get involved. The, main, uh, the first one, and probably uh, the, the, um, the most novel, is something Kate has already mentioned called field labs. And these, the thinking behind these is that farms and growers, by and large, try stuff out all the time anyway. Um, so people are experimenting all the time. Um, in, in reality, as Nick mentioned, a lot, of the, a lot of the innovation that takes place takes place on farm because of that initiative. But it can be quite a frustrating experience. So sometimes you can try things out and it's not always clear whether it's worked or not. And uh, the idea with the field labs is to bring small groups of farmers and growers together on farms and to uh, meet two or three times to follow a trial or um, some other kind of uh, DIY research through from start to finish. And through that, to learn what makes an effective trial, how to get the most out of the time and money that people spend on trying things out. And if you need research help from scientists and so on as well, then how to get that help when you need it. So that's the point of the, of the field labs. We've, we've started eight of those already, and we've got lots more in the pipeline and even more to, to sort of come up with, with ideas from uh, people who are willing to host these, uh, these uh, field labs. And the ones we've had so far, just to give you a flavor, include things on, uh, on red clover, looking at the effect on the fertility of sheep uh, who are on that red clover and how to manage that for the best results, looking at, uh, at uh, reducing antibiotics in dairy and also some, um, some work on alternatives to peat for seed propagation. So that's the flavor of the ones that are already happening. There are more than that, plus, uh, plus some additional <coughs> ones that are already in the pipeline for the future. The second strand is uh, what we're calling matchmaking, and that's basically where uh, farmers do want research help, and particularly groups of farmers, then helping put them in touch with relevant researchers and getting the ball rolling on the funding um, and, and helping kind of smooth that process out and, uh, and, and get those farmer-led uh, research proposals feeding through to the main research funders, because one of the gaps is that actually the research funders don't get that many proposals from, uh, from groups of farmers and researchers who are, who are um, doing things organically. And that's very much, that's, that bit of the work's led by ORC and very much tied in with the participatory research network. The final uh, sort, of, sort of main way to get involved is uh, we have our own small research fund, and it is quite small in the grand scheme of things, but uh, we hope we'll get a lot of mileage out of it. Unlike most research funds, the priorities for it get set by farmers and growers rather than by people sitting in a darkened, smoke-filled room and, uh, or in a research lab somewhere. And uh, they are 
the proposals are also reviewed by farmers and growers uh, as well as by scientists. And that's quite unusual. The first batch of research ideas and challenges from, uh, from producers are now in, uh, but by all means keep them coming and they can go into the second round. It's at the stage now where we'll put those ideas and challenges out to the research community, get ideas in, team the researchers up with interested farmers and growers to work up really short but, but practical proposals, and then those will go through a review process and, and the, the best ones and the most relevant ones will get funded. That's the gist of it. And if you want to get involved, and please do, uh, then uh, either grab me or Ben Raskin, who's there, or Ewan Briley, who's there, um, or, or, of course, any of the ORC team as well. Thanks. Is it okay if I just... Yeah. Hi. Um, hello, I'm uh, Wendy Seal from the Organic Growers Alliance, and I would just like to um, mention um, springboarding from the um, Dutch Originals program. The Organic Growers Alliance are developing a research and development strategy for small scale, small to medium scale um, organic growers. And we have a meeting um, I'd like to bring your attention to on the 6th of March. Um, it's uh, sponsored by Sheffield University and also the environmental um, sustainability knowledge uh, transfer network. Um, if I get that right. Um, so it's a meeting specifically to bring growers, um, horticultural suppliers together with scientists. And it's going to be a, a brainstorming session to, to, to really kickstart a, an R&D strategy for um, small scale horticulture. And I think hopefully um, we have some uh, flyers about that downstairs. Is that right, Phil? Not yet. <laughs> they're, 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 we're, as soon as we get them printed, they'll be downstairs. So, okay, thank you. So, I'd, on the back of that, and um, there's another initiative that I think we're very keen to support. Um, I'd urge you all to get engaged in some way. We have a, a wonderful mix of producers, researchers, advisors, and others uh, in the audience today. There's an, a, an ideal opportunity to forge alliances between. Parties that often are only working within their own circles, certainly on the research side. Um, so, so get engaged. I, I really hope that the workshops that you're going to get engaged with now can come up with some interesting and, and relevant action points that might be taken forward, whether they're research ideas, as we've just talked about, or policy initiatives, or regulation changes, or other issues that you think might be important. Uh, it would be good to identify these things that we can um, maybe take forward uh, after the conference. I would like to also draw your attention downstairs. You'll find both trade stands and all over the place posters about work that has been taking place that is not necessarily being presented in the sessions. Make use of the opportunities to meander around uh, and look at those. There's lots of information there that you can pick up. Um, I, we're just about to go into lunch, so I will emphasize that we have worked very closely with the conference venue to ensure that the food is organic. I'm assured that it is organic. Um, after last year, the venue has taken the issue very seriously. And I think those of you who've had coffee and um, tea and biscuits and things like that so far will have seen the signs that uh, things have stepped up a grade. I hope it continues through into the meals. We look forward to it. Um, uh, and that's through into the conference dinner, which is very well attended this evening. So there will be a bar um, and also organic drinks. I'm saying all this now because we don't see each other all in one group again until tomorrow afternoon as we go into our respective workshops. I just wanted to check with Roger whether there's any changes to the workshop program. Roger, uh, at least where they're located. Do you want to go f say something, Roger? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for your votes. You had 140 votes, uh, and as a result of which, we're going to have to make one room change. Uh, and that's going to be grass lot, uh, grassland and livestock, or workshop three and workshop four, will actually swap their rooms. And just to give you a bit of guidance on that, the arable strand is going to be in suite 4A, which if you go out of these doors, is the, uh, the doors are directly opposite you. Um, horticulture is going to be in suite six, which actually is the front of this area here, but you won't be able to come through the, the double doors. You have to go around the back corridor and come in that door over near the, carid, uh, the corridor. Grassland is now going to be in 5C, which is the back left area, which you can come in the same doors as you did for this big um, um, plenary session. And the other strand is going to be in 5DE, which is the 
back right as I'm looking, so it's over where the uh, red poster boards, and again you have to go around the back corridor and come in through the doors over there. Uh, and the uh, livestock uh, 4B session is the back to corridor, turn left. There are signs, just look out for the signs, but if you would, please, just make, make a change to the piece of paper in your pack. And, and where it says 4B, put 5C, and where it says 5C, put 4B. And can I please encourage you to take your bags and all your paraphernalia with you, because the staff can have to come in and create three rooms where there's one. Thank okay. You. Can I just ask you to give one final round of applause for the speakers and enjoy the conference. <laughs>